Uh, happy Mother's Day to all of you who are in the audience. Uh, American Mother's Day, I should say. <laughs> and thank you all for coming on early on a Sunday morning. And I'll just start it off by saying aloha. <laughs> right? Aloha. aloha. You have to say it back. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, biogeography and evolution. And you see I've been a bit redundant in the title because Oceania, it really is in the Pacific. It refers to the remote islands in the Pacific. But just to be clear, I put it in there, uh, but I know it's redundant. So why would somebody work in, in uh, Oceania? Well, um, there's a, a lot of reasons, but the most important one, I think, is the isolation of the ecosystems and the islands and the uh, opportunity for evolution to work at a faster pace. So within, within a sh relatively short amount of time, you get a lot of uh, evolutionary activity. But it's also because there's a lot of different habitats out there. And people think, if you haven't worked in the Pacific, you think sometimes that all these islands are very similar. In reality, they're really very different. They have different histories. Some of them are young, uh, volcanic, like in Hawaii. Uh, some of them are continental. Uh, and some of them are uplifted, but there'll be old rock that's recently uplifted, so it has a, a totally introduced uh, recent flora. You got low islands and atolls and, and lots of isolated terrestrial ecosystems. I'm not, in this talk, going to talk about marine things. So look, at, this is the way I divided it up, just for the purposes of talking about it, with the Hawaiian islands. Uh, and, the, and then over here you have Southeast Polynesia. You could call it French Polynesia, except it includes the Cook Islands. And they're not French, so they get all upset if you call it that. Uh, Southwest Polynesia, which has Fiji and Samoa in it, uh, and then uh, Micronesia, and then the Bonin Islands up in the northwest, uh, which a lot of people don't include in their Pacific analysis, but there's a tremendous number of plants, at least, in the Bonin Islands that are related to things in the Hawaiian Islands and in the Society Islands. Uh, it's far north, but it has the same currents and the warm air, and so it's actually quite a holiday place for Japanese tourists. It's uh, fairly, the islands are fairly isolated from one another. These are in kilometers. So you can see that uh, it's 3,700 to 4,500 kilometers from the closest Hawaiian island, the big island, to the continental United States. Uh, and it's 3,500 kilometers down to the Marquesas. And those are the closest sources for terrestrial organisms to Hawaii. Uh, everything else is even further than that. Now, there, the, the big unknown in this is how big the line islands used to be, and we'll talk about that um, in a minute. But you can see that you're really quite a distance from other places. You can almost get that side of the globe with no land on it, not quite. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands are unique uh, in that they have a very well-dated and well-studied size and age. I mean, the, they run uh, equipment around the base of these and reconstructed all the islands based on the big blocks that fell off of them, you know, and, and figured out how tall the islands were and when it happened. And you can see down here in the, south, in the uh, bottom left corner, through time, uh, the size of the islands, because the Pacific plate moves over a hot spot, the islands are formed by volcanic activity, and they're in a progression series. So the oldest island is on the left, and the youngest island is down in the southeast on the, on the right, which is the big island of Hawaii. But what's important here is that five million years ago, there was almost nothing to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, only Hawaii was of any size. So essentially, you're looking at a, the majority of the flora and fauna of the Hawaiian Islands is no older than about five million years. There's a few things that are still hanging out on some of the older islands. Um, but for the most part, it's a relatively young uh, ecosystem. There are some other islands in the Pacific that have similar uh, patterns. If you look at uh, the Society Islands and uh, uh, Austral Islands, you'll see that they have a pattern of the oldest island being down uh, on the right side and the youngest island up on the upper left corner. But the problem is that there's always a different island in there that's, that's an older age that's back where the younger islands should be. Uh, and they're no longer active. So these chains are no longer producing new islands. Uh, other important uh, structures, if you look in, in between Australia and New Zealand on Google Earth, 
you'll see that, that you can see the remains of a, a big chunk of Australia that broke off this called Zealandia. And uh, there's some indication that most of this might have been submerged about 20 million years ago. So that the floor of New Zealand and even of New Caledonia may be no older than uh, 20 million years. So I started working in the Pacific in 1992 when I went out in the field with Warren Wagner. And actually, I work on composites on the Asteraceae, which you'll find out in a minute. And I go where the plants take me. So <coughs> the Pacific is one of the places I work, but not the only place. I like to work on sky islands, i.e. mountains, as well. So what is the purpose of this project? Well, this is a huge collaborative effort to understand evolution of life in Oceania. And we're asking this based on uh, pattern analysis, based on phylogenies. Uh, where are all the species in each clade? So do multiple clades share the same pattern? And if so, is there a, uh, something about these patterns that allows us to help understand evolution in the Pacific? <coughs> these are some of the many people that I've been in the field with and worked with. Uh, students and <coughs> colleagues, uh, bird people, uh, s s fly people, spider people. Uh, so it's been it's a, a very nice interactive group. So there, there are five uh, categories of this talk, things that I think are important, because I'm not going to talk about the things you've heard before. I'm not going to talk about very much about uh, adaptive radiations of honeycreepers and uh, lobelias and things that are really well known and, and popular. I'll, I'll mention them, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to try to focus on some things you may not have heard before. So the first thing I want to point out is there's, we're finding all kinds, uh, using phylogenetic <coughs> systematics, uh, we're finding out all kinds of new source areas. So the, many of the islands were long believed to have the majority of their taxa coming from Australia, New Guinea, uh, Asia, you know, from that sort of area because it's almost a stepping stone. You saw from Sandy's talk with the maps of the Wallace's line that there, there's a, a row of, of a, there's a path one could follow. We're finding out that's not always the case. I'm going to give you um, two examples. The first one is the, the group I work on. Oops, so the first one's a, actually a thrush, uh, the Hawaiian thrush, and uh, it used to be uh, believed to be from Asia, but now it's uh, American. It's clearly an American <coughs> extraction. And I'd also point out, you see the subfossil, that because of Helen James and Storrs Olson and others' work, we now know there were a lot more birds in Hawaii before the Europeans arrived than we thought. So uh, there's a, a many uh, taxa that have been added to the diagrams, as we heard yesterday morning, is being done in other groups. But if you look at this list of the birds, of Hawaii, you can see that uh, we've changed a lot of them to North America or New World or some of them uh, from being in Asia. Although the big winner is that they now confirm that the honey creepers are uh, from Asia <laughs> instead of being ambiguous. Okay, so the composite of the Pacific, uh, following the trail of sunflowers and daisies, uh, it's been probably not a group most people think of. It. You know, when you think about the Pacific, you think orchids and uh, gingers and things like that. But in reality, uh, comps are one of the larger groups, at least in the uh, uh, Polynesian area. But the only thing I want to point out about here, I'm not going to give you an electron comp, is that they have many characters that are great for colonization. <coughs> if you look at this, the, 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 the single head on a composite can carry from one to a thousand flowers. So if you get one seed that manages to survive, it'll produce usually many flowers that gives it uh, the ability to not have to have another plant. So you only need uh, one to get started. By the way, if you've never seen an artichoke flower, that's what it looks like. So it's a thistle. And they have a, a pappus, which is a, a really good dispersal mechanism. I'll show you a picture of that. And uh, the fruit is, uh, some of them actually have been soaked in salt water for up to six months and still are viable. Just a few, but they can do it. So that's sort of what the variety, oh, and they have a variety of pollinators. So even though bees are probably the most effective, just about anything that walks across the top of the flower can spread pollen from one place to another. And they, they really are not very territorial. So you, know, you can find a half a dozen different things on, on one flowering head. So if we look at the comps uh, of Oceania, you'll see that there's uh, 38 to 43 lineages, 36 genera, 172 species, of which we have now sequenced uh, 170 of, and we know exactly what, where the hell they fit in the phylogeny. 
154 are endemic to the uh, to Oceania, and uh, 133 are in five radiations. So you can see that it's a jackpot kind of thing. You know, you've got one here and one there and one here and two there, and then all of a sudden, bang, something hits it and, and takes off. But they have a lot of different uh, morphologies. Uh, you'd never recognize all these as being uh, in the comps, probably. Some of them are bird pollinated, like that's a Bidens in the upper left hand corner. Bird pollinated Bidens. So, so here's a way I'm going to just explain it. There's sort of three general areas uh, source material could come from. It could come from Asia, uh, and uh, you know, it can come from Australia, from the south, and it can come from Mexico and the US, you know, America's on the, on the east. Uh, there's only one known, uh, it's not a comp, there's only one known dispersal from Alaska, from the Aleutian Islands, it's on a mountaintop, <laughs> but other than that. But you can see here that um, lineages originating in Asia and Southeast Asia, they're almost all on the western uh, islands. You can see, and, they, and almost none of them radiate. They're, they're uh, relatively uh, closer to their sources for one thing, but you can see the bony islands have uh, about four to six endemic cacti, all, and all of them are from Asia, and all of them, if you know the family, except for one or two, are in what we call the old world clays in the family. They come from the thistles, they come from the mums, they come from the dandelions, they come from the groups that are coming from Asia. There are 13 to 14 introductions, 19 species, 10 are endemic. Let's look at that. Uh, there's two slides for this, Australia, area, you can see that most of these are in the southern part of the, of the Pacific. Uh, very few of them are endemic. There's like three, I think. Uh, 14 introductions, almost all just one or two taxa. And the funny part about this is they're almost all in the asters. So you've got the old world tribes coming in from the west, you've got the asters coming up from the south, but let's look what happens when we add Hawaii into this. There's three radiations, also from the asters, into Hawaii, all of which went 3, 2, and 14. Uh, and so this is the largest clay coming from the, coming from the south. So 14 to 18 introduction, 33 species. All right, so now we're looking at from Western, what came from Western North America? And where are they located? Well, they're all in Polynesia and Hawaii, and they're all in the Helianthi. They're all in the Sunflower Alliance. So many different introductions, but all from the same group within the family. And these happen to be places where they're dominant. Like one of the two big groups in Australia is the asters, the other is the Nephala, even the Nephala you only got there once. <laughs> but the asters took off in the southern part. The biggest tribes in, the, in Asia are the ones I mentioned, and, and they came from there. And the biggest uh, assemblage in North America is the Helianthi Alliance. So it's really a matter of opportunity and location. Uh, so the bottom line to all this is the origin of the composite in the Pacific all has to do with where you came from, and, uh, uh, and that's what's really uh, important. It's where you came from and what was there in that place at the time of the dispersal. Now remember, this is all done within about you know, five million years, more or less, a lot of it. All right, so the second thing is that islands are not dead ends. Uh, uh, Sherwin Collins, <coughs> who was my inspiration for working in the, in the Pacific with his book, Island Biology, um, Said that, you know, he said that when things get to an island, they stay. You know, so if they're going to survive, they lose their ability to disperse. Because where are you going to go if you're on an island into the water? So the, the selection pressure for things that survive on islands is to not uh, disperse, unless you're a beach colonizer, which is a, another matter. So I'm just going to show you a few really quick examples so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, we've worked on the Pacific Bidens. We've just finished it. It's about to be submitted. This is, in t this is where they grow, they're on the mountain tops. So this is, we're setting up a camp on the Pitohiki in Tahiti a couple of years ago. Uh, we almost got blown off. But, so these are the, there are 41 species of Bidens in the Pacific. Pretty impressive, huh? I think it is. Uh, and um, the ones in green are the ones we collected and have sequenced. The ones in blue are uh, the, the ones we have not been able to get. And we got the red one down there uh, from Rapa. So we have that one in the, in the diagram as well. But they're really not like the dot Bidens you think about at all. For those of you who don't know Bidens, it's called beggar's tick or tick seed because it sticks all over your pants legs when you're hiking. 
Here are some of the uh, different uh, species. Um, the, the, my favorite one is this one, the second one from the left on the top. It's torta. You notice the akines are twisted. They're um, in a big spiral. Very different from the ones you see here on the... But the first thing they do, if you look at this uh, picture over here on the left, is they almost all lose their spines. They lose their, bra their, their retorsally barbed arms that sit at the top of the akine that stick in your pants legs and in your dog's fur when you take him for a walk. Um, the one, and the one on the left is, is a, a species from the mainland. So that's what they normally look like on the left. And then the other three are ones from the islands. But look at this. So the Hawaiian Islands, one introduction. And then in the Marquesas, you have an introduction into the Marquesas. From the Marquesas, it went to the Society Islands. And Rapa is where? It's nested uh, also in the, uh, in the Polynesian Society Islands. So it, it went from Hawaii. Well, you don't know for sure it went to Hawaii. It could have gone to both Hawaii and the Marquesas at the same time. But once it got to the Marquesas, it went to the Society Islands and then on to Rapa. So you have a really nice uh, uh, pattern of dispersal within the Pacific for, uh, uh, for this group. If you look at sandalwood, which is also a really interesting group, um, very important commercially. There's uh, 15 species. And if you look at the um, distribution, uh, what you find is that you've got two introductions into Hawaii. And then from Hawaii, you've gone to the Eastern Polynesia, which is the blue, and the Bonin Islands, which is the green. So things are moving around. You know, once they get in the islands, they're not just going there and uh, staying put. Uh, Astelia is probably, it's probably the most interesting of, oops, sorry. Yeah, it's got a lot of different forms and grows in a lot of different habitats across the Pacific and other places. But look at this distribution. It's really getting around. You've got um, the yellow is a, sort of a yellow color or islands. So you've got the Society Islands here. You've got the Marquesas up there nested in Hawaii. So it goes to Hawaii, then it goes to Marquesas, but it independently goes to the Society Islands. It goes from Australia to New Zealand to over the, across the Pacific on the islands. Uh, so, so these things are not, they're bird dispersed. So these things are not staying put. Uh, Totally, they do sometimes. The Hawaiian Drosophila, Rob DeSalle has been working on these uh, uh, for years, but Patrick O'Grady has taken over the mantle of Pacific Drosophila. And there's over a thousand species in the Hawaiian Islands of Drosophila. And if you look at the uh, phylogeny, you find, and this is one of the groups that's older than the islands. So the flies can live on the low atolls and, and smaller islands. And so Drosophila, the Hawaiian Drosophila are a monophyletic group. They're sister to Scaptomyza. But look what happens in the middle of Scaptomyza. You have a, uh, they're from North America. You have a reintroduction in North America from the Hawaiian Islands. So they not only go, but they come back sometimes. and it's not going. Oh, there it is. Good. Metrosideris, this is one that we used to think, oh, for non-radiating taxa. The number three is uh, not all the taxa radiate. For many years, we ignored the non-radiating taxa because they weren't in interesting. You've got 14 species on the set of islands. They're really interesting because you can look at the diversification and the pattern of it. But we didn't really look at the ones that had only one. But if you look at the flora, at least of the Hawaiian Islands, a third of the, a third of the lineages have one endemic species. So we were essentially ignoring a third of the flora uh, with stories that it might have to tell us. So if we look at uh, Metrosideris, uh, this one is across the Pacific and was originally believed to have a number of species in Hawaii. Uh, it had adapted to bogs and mountaintops and grew on black lava, and it's, it's an iconic plant there. But what they found when they did the microsatellite studies is it's really related to the island. So it has re-evolved into all the different habitats on each island. So the bog species are not related to one another. They're based on the different clades they're in. It's all about location. It's all about what island they're on and re-adapting on each island to living in different kinds of situations. And then there's this one, this great blowfly. 
that actually turns out to be a hybrid. So it was identified as a particular species for many, many years, a widespread Pacific taxon. And in reality, it's a hybrid between uh, a US species and a New Zealand species. So by ignoring the single taxon uh, clades, we were missing a lot of interesting information. Fossil history, there's almost no fossils in, in the Pacific. I mean, the islands come up, they erode, anything that they have is gone. But Helen uh, James and Storrs Olson have been working on uh, bird fossils found in lava tubes. Uh, they're not, they're called subfossils because they're not old enough to be real fossils. And they're finding uh, also in some other cases plants and snail uh, results. And if you look at the history of the Hawaiian archipelago based on the data that these people have been uh, creating, you'll see that half of the birds were extinct when Europeans arrived. So half of the birds were driven into extinction by the Polynesians when they first colonized the Hawaiian Islands. All the flightless ones, for one, uh, they had, uh, and, a, and a number of others. And now there's only 11 species of the original fauna that are not endangered. Uh, snails, the Hawaiian snails are amazing, and I don't know snails very well, because uh, that, you know, I don't study invertebrates, but the ones in Hawaii are, are really cool in that you have males and females, but they, when they mate, they both bear young. So uh, they're hermaphroditic, but they have to mate in order to be able to, to reproduce. Uh, it takes five to seven years for them to become sexually mature, and uh, they don't eat the host plant. They'll stay on one plant their whole life, and they eat the lichens and stuff on the leaves. Uh, and so they don't damage the plant, they actually keep it free of, of uh, something that blocks the sunlight. They're absolutely spectacular, so you can imagine what's happened to them. They're almost all extinct or, or, or seriously endangered. Um, and then this is a study that uh, Bernie did with a bunch of co-authors, and they looked at some caves on the oldest island on Kauai, and they sifted through all the things that had washed down into the cave from the sides of the uh, eroding volcano and uh, sifted it out and identified it. And without going into a lot of detail, what they found was that the same pattern we saw in the birds. There's a big extinction of many things when the Polynesians arrive and then another big drop with extinctions when the Europeans arrive. It's a sort of a, a very distinct curve. And they found the same thing with seeds and pollen and the, and the bird bones. They've actually found that ants used to be on the Hawaiian Islands, went extinct and were reintroduced. So the, the ants they have, the native ants they have today are not from the same clade as the original one. So the last thing I want to just say is that there's lots of, once you get a lot of these uh, diagrams, you stack them up, you look at them, there's really lots of interesting evolutionary questions. And I'm just going to give you a couple, um, so a few, so that you can see what I'm talking about. There's the adaptive radiations that everybody knows about. But what I'm interested in with this, honey creeper adaptive radiation, which uh, follows, by the way, the progression rule of the age of the islands, which you find in, a, in a, about half of the taxa, is the coevolution aspect of it. Because it's not just an adaptively radiated into a habitat. It's adaptively radiated to match the evolution of the lobelias, which are the plant that it, it that the pollinator of. So you have a matched uh, evolution. This one follows the progression rule as well, and you get 125 species. It's the largest plant radiation on any archipelago. Originally, they proposed five colonization events. There's only one, and it's radiated throughout the islands, and it's got a very old age as well. Uh, you can look at rapid speciation. This is, uh, I'm using a lot of bird examples <laughs> here because they seem to do this better and faster than any of the other organisms. But you see that the, uh, in the Pleistocene diversification of white eyes, you have a, a rapid radiation with lots of different morphology there. You also have the golden uh, mangrove whistler, uh, golden uh, whistler or the mangrove whistler, <laughs> which has 66 uh, subspecies spread across um, Indonesia. And finally, the um, Perry Shaw's work on crickets shows the uh, same kind of pattern. And uh, hers is based on sexual selection. This is interesting in that you can look at rates of speciation. When you have independent introductions into different island groups that are more or less in the same ballpark as far as age goes, you can look at the numbers of species 
on each island to see, uh, you know, about the, di the different rates. And you can see that you know, when, when this uh, particular genus of plants got to the Hawaiian Islands, um, there's 14 species in 3 million years. When it got to Australia, there's three species in two million years. And when it had two introductions to the Galapagos Islands, four million years, one species, one million year, one species. So the speciation rates in, on different island groups uh, are very different from one another. So great way to study that kind of a, a question. Uh, recently, they've been doing a lot of next-gen sequencing and using uh, uh, these uh, trees that show you all the different multiple branching patterns these coalescent species trees. And then on top of it, they've overlaid the, the black lines, which are the uh, uh, Bayesian trees. And you can see the support for the Bayesian tree uh, on the top of it with the coalescent tree behind it. This is a palm tree, Chichardia, which grows all over the uh, Pacific, uh, but it's particularly diverse in Hawaii. So there's been lots of different, um, it's not a clean break, I guess is the, the message here. This is one of my favorite groups of student. I was on a committee working on this, Caprasma and the Rubiaceae. Um, you, he, he reconstructed the ancestral distribution and got repeated dispersal, long distance dispersal events. But the thing that's cool about this is there's two introductions into Hawaii. Uh, the, the lime green is Hawaii. So there's a single species here that didn't radiate, and then there's a large one up at the top that did radiate. This one down here on the bottom is blue fruited. You know, it never radiated once it got to the Hawaiian Islands. The orange fruited ones, which are up at the top, did. So evidently, and they're about the same age. So evidently, the idea of uh, the orange fruit was uh, way more susceptible to dis being dispersed to other islands than the blue fruit because it just hangs out in more or less the same habitat it came in on. But you can see this is also in Samoa. Uh, it's on the, in the Chatham Islands off the coast of New Zealand, but it's a, the thing that's cool about this is it's a New Zealand originated clade, which is very rare. Um, New Zealand is another one of those places that uh, things radiate a lot, and at least in the plants on the islands, but they don't necessarily go too far uh, afield. But this one has, came from Australia, went to um, New Zealand, and then out of New Zealand radiated across the Pacific multiple times. Oh, this is just a representation of it. You can see the blue fruited one up there as opposed to the orange fruited ones. I said, well, maybe they learned the same thing I did in botany, is never eat a blue fruit, you know? <laughs> uh, so Anne Sakai and Warren Wagner and John Price and others have lately been discussing a lot about how the plants got to the Pacific. What's the dominant method of dispersal uh, and uh, it's almost all of them, if you look at their counterparts uh, on the continents in the source areas, yeah. it's almost always bird dispersed. So they, but the question is, or the concept is, I guess, is that it's probably not, there's only three or four birds that regularly, with any regularity, migrate to Hawaii. You, uh, the, the golden uh, plover, the bar-tailed godwit, and a couple of others. And uh, none of those are believed to be the ones carrying these because they're not coming from northern North America. They're coming from northwest Mexico, southwest US. Uh, and most of the birds that migrate in the Pacific go down one side and up the other. They don't go straight across the, the open ocean. So we have sort of, in our naive mechanical way, <laughs> have decided that most of the dispersal events Plus, it's got to be something that's not visiting regularly or you have gene flow. And if you've got gene flow, you're not going to have these rapid radiations that are taking place on, on the islands. So we've sort of decided as a group that it's probably flocks of birds <coughs> that are blown off course by a hurricane or something. So they get there, and they either survive or they don't. But it doesn't make any difference to the plants. They've got a seed stuck on the outside of them, or even if they've eaten one, it just provides fertilizer if the bird dies, so the plant has a better shot at making it. Um, because if you had any kind of regular visitation, you wouldn't have the kind of speciation that we see in the islands. And then, uh, but you know, people say, well, what about water dispersal? Well, let's look at that. This is pandanus, or screw pine, as we call it. 
which has radiated all over the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the ones that the, uh, Tim Gallagher has studied are the clay that has gotten out across the Pacific. Uh, the pandanus roots, are pretty, <coughs> these are pretty well engineered. They have a sweet edible tissue at the base. Uh, they have a, their syncarp dispersed in the end, so they have multiple seeds here in the middle, and that's buoyant. <coughs> so you've got built into one package lots of seeds, something that somebody might like to eat, and the ability to float. And they've done uh, testing on this uh, to show that it can withstand quite a bit of time in the, in the water. The, uh, the ecology of these is really pretty interesting. I was tickled, somebody was talking about Darwin floating seeds, uh, trying to figure out uh, how long they would be viable in water because we, it, we're still doing that. <laughs> Technology has not changed too much, uh, in, in, at least for figuring out if seeds can uh, uh, float and still be reproducible. But on the islands that have mammals, uh, which all of them have at least bats, uh, these fruits are picked up and carried inland. So you've got a great dispersal mechanism. It has multiple seeds. Something picks it up, eats part of it, and discards the rest. And this, I love this picture, was taken, this is cassowary poop in, uh, in Australia, where the birds have been eating the, <coughs> the seeds and then uh, putting them in their big mound. So it's a great dispersal uh, apparatus. Of course, uh, many of the Pacific Islands only have bats. That's the only mammal that they have. Here's a cladogram for it. You can see that um, evolution of ocean dispersal and animal dispersal is retained multiple seeds per propagule, and they're facultatively apomictic, which means they don't need to outcross, um, take place at that one point in the cladogram. And you can see that uh, has resulted in two subgenera, Visonia, which is smaller than Pandanus, which is a, the larger one. And uh, let's look at what that does to their ability to disperse and, and diversify. The big uh, circle and the little one next to it are the two ones that have these key innovations. So Pandanus and Visonia uh, make up by far the bi biggest distribution, the most species, uh, and they're the most successful group in, in, uh, in, in Pandanus. So those key innovations have allowed it to uh, move out of its core uh, distribution area. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is the Hawaiian honey eaters. And they were called that because they're almost identical in their behavior and they very similar in appearance to the Australian honey eaters. They were called that for years. And then Rob Plusher and uh, his colleagues uh, sequenced uh, these and got a nice result, which is they're not related to them at all. That is total convergent evolution of behavior uh, and appearance and they're actually related to fairy wrens and wax wings, and they're from North America. So very different story than what was originally thought. Uh, adaptive radiations, uh, this is uh, uh, Rosie Gillespie's work. She's working on ecomorphs of spiders. These are called happy face spiders, and um, there are four ecomorphs, four different colors. Uh, well, three colors and two sizes. So you got big browns, little browns, greens, and purples. And what happened when they actually did the phylogeny of this, that the 16 species, which they have, are, are uh, follow the progression rule, but look what happens with the color morphs. Except for the green color morph, all of them have evolved more than once on different islands. You never find the same color morph on the same island from two different lineages. So it's like they, they, are, they can evolve into, all of them can evolve into different color morphs, but they never do it if the other, something is there that already has that morph in that location. <coughs> so you, the green is obviously the plesiomorphic color for the clade, and, uh, and then you've had the evolution into the other color morphs. Very interesting. We can also take a look at age. <coughs> this is a Hawaiian island. Uh, we don't have this kind of detailed information yet for the others, but we're working on it. And the list on the left, the, the, the letters stand for the names of the islands. And they start with the oldest, which is Pearl and Hermes, which is a, a, a toll off the, off the uh, <coughs> P. 
past the last high island. But you can see that you have a few things that we know of that are old enough to have been on the outer islands. But really, the vast majority of things came in with Kauai right here, and then Oahu, Maui Nui, and Hawaii. So it's really a, 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 the ability to be able to look at the age of the islands. We can even, the fly guys can even look at the age of the lava flows. They can show on the big island, there's five volcanoes, there's been radiation on the big island uh, because of the uh, different ages of the different lava flows, which is a, probably an example of vicariance, one of the few examples we really have in the Pacific. And then the last thing is there's unsolved mysteries. <laughs> and uh, here's a couple of them. My favorite one is on the left. This is a composite. It's honey cooper pollinated in Hawaii. Uh-oh, my diagram disappeared. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you what it says. <laughs> this clay has three species right here. The sutra clay, or the, the clay uh, just below it on the, on the diagram from Australia. All the rest of those, all the rest of those clays are found in Africa at the base. Blue is Africa. So, and is much older than, than any of the other composites in the Hawaiian Islands. So the question is, where was this thing hiding out between 12 and 15 million years ago and uh, five million years ago? It didn't even come in on Kauai. I think it came in on, up here. I think this came in on, uh, Hesperomania is believed to be 3.36 million years old. So if it left, if it left Africa at the base of the ironweed tribe 12 to 15 million years ago, and it showed up in Hawaii at 3 million years ago, where the hell was it? <laughs> you know, and what was it doing? Um, the other one on the right is, um, oh, here. This, this one is um, the Hawaiian eagle, which is extinct. And there was a big debate uh, because the, they only knew it from the bones. And the bones were identical to the uh, white-tailed eagle from Asia. So they had just assumed that it was a variant, you know, just it moved in, it lived for a while, it went extinct. Things that, like that happen all the time in the Hawaiian Islands. They get uh, snowy owls there about every four or five years. You know, what the heck, this owl lives up in Hawaii, so it's interesting. But this guy, so they figured it was like that. It got in, it lived for a while, it died, it left some bones in the lava tube, and, and uh, that's all there was to it. But then they did, uh, they were able to do some microsatellite work on it and found out that molecularly this thing has diverged a tremendous amount. Usually in the islands it's the exact opposite. You have huge morphological differences and almost no genetic signature to follow because it's all been so rapid. Here we have an instance where the physical look of the bone structure at least is identical to the white tail uh, eel, but the molecular signature is very different saying that it's been separated for quite some time. So the Hawaiian eagle is now a good species and um, uh, it's recognized and it's, it is most closely related to genetically the white-tailed eagle. So it, it was a white-tailed eagle that got to Hawaii, but it's been there a lot longer than they thought and it had diversified. So with that, I'm just gonna conclude the uh, there's a lot of things you can say about evolution in the Pacific and things that we've learned and things that we don't know, but I'm not gonna go over the stuff I've already said. I'm gonna point a few things, the things in red are the things that I haven't talked about that I think are really interesting. Uh, one of them is that the Western Islands have almost no diversification radiations on them, at least for, for plants and animals. Um, there's a lot more species. We're finding a lot of cryptic species when we start looking. Uh, we can distinguish between vicariance and long distance dispersal. I haven't really talked about that. Uh, and marine organisms I haven't talked about, but they're showing, many of the ones with pelagic larvae are showing the same kinds of patterns we're seeing with the terrestrial plants. Uh, ecosystem function is a bridge, I think, between conservation and biogeography, and it's something we're looking at now. Uh, and that's it. I just wanna say we couldn't have done this without museum specimens. And Lynn, is Lynn here? You left out the botany picture. <laughs> <laughs> the body pictures in the upper upper left hand corner. Um, and uh, mahalo nui loa. Thank you.